What's going on, people? It's your guy, Real Estate Investor Next Door, here with my guy, Cordero, rocking my Millie merch. You know, uh, Millie merch big time down here in the Atlanta area, man. So, you know, y'all got to go check it out. And cop it at the mall or whatever, you know. It's good you stuff, man. You got, you, that? you got the drip on, man. You got the Millie merch. But, um... But anyways, man, it's Fundamental Friday, man. So we're going to show y'all, like, how we get down, uh, you know, on Fridays. We're going to show y'all, like, some tactical stuff that, hey, look, this is what you need to be able to do, right? <laughs> Actual, yeah. physical, tangible stuff for you to go do or you need to know how to do in order to wholesale real estate. So today we're going to be talking about how to put a property on another contract. Like, how do you go about getting somebody under contract? How do you fill out that contract, um, you know, and make it where it's beneficial for you? You know what I'm saying? Um, how do you protect yourself inside of these contracts? All the other good stuff. Everybody want to know paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. I didn't know what was in the contract. I didn't know what to put in the contract. I didn't know who to send the contract to. Contract, contract, contract. Everybody talking about how contracts is holding them back, how they could have done it, but they couldn't figure out the contract, how they would have done this, but I didn't know how to put them in the contract. We showing you how to get it done today. You ever heard somebody say that, Cordero? It was a contract. Uh, <laughs> any little fundamental thing. What's up, Ali, by the way? But is any little fundamental thing like that, um, but as we talked about earlier this week on Mindset Monday, when you get to a point where it's less, I don't know what I'm doing, so I can't go, and I don't know what I'm doing, so I just need to figure it out, and you switch it from one to the other, that's when you're on your way. So that's why we're here. That's why we're bringing it to you, Fundamental Fridays, man. We can definitely show you how to do this contract. Yeah. I remember like contracts all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, nowadays, man, you know, we hire people, they take care of the contract, stuff like that. So, you know, we don't have to do too much of that. So, um, but anyways, man, we're going to go ahead and throw this contract up and get to it, man. Um, so, if you look at this contract, it's a basic, you know, basic agreement. You know what I'm saying? Uh, a lot of people, like, when it's, you know, it's one page. So, sometimes sellers will argue, like, why is this one page, da 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 what do you say to sellers like that, Cordero? I said, man, damn, bye. We don't want your house anyway. No, I'm just playing. But um, what I kind of do is this is my thing. Everything I say, I like to get in front of it. So I try not to wait until the seller has something to say about it, especially from experience when I know some sellers are going to say something about it. I try to get in front of it. So before they say this, which means that I need make it a practice or a habit to do this on every call. I highlight it as a benefit. And the benefit in this case is like, yeah, man, we, we got a purchase agreement. And again, ours isn't, it's not some seven, 10 pay with a lot of extra complicated stuff. It's just a basic one page agreement that has what like I call King James version. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I kind of like, we ain't got the King James version that the, I always say the hither two fourths widths and hints for <laughs> Thine, thine thithers and all of that stuff. I say, no, nah, we just got a one pager and it's got the basic details of the agreement. And I point it as a benefit. It's like, so that way you can get whoever you like to look at it, but it's our company policy that we go over it with you. And we can go over it as less than 10 minutes. I can go over each line in the, in the purchase agreement and just detail out everything. So if you have questions, uh, then you can ask me right there. Um, but again, it's just a one pager. And my point, the biggest point I want to like it, the conversational piece, what that looks like when you're actually explaining it. Once you've gotten a seller a little bit further along and they're about ready to go and you're like, man, this is this, this, you know, this person ready to go. I think the numbers work and everything. Now it's like drop that in the conversation before they ask about it. So, yeah, I, we, you know, if everything works out, I got to check with my underwriting team. But I want to make sure we can get that purchase price for you. But if everything works out. I'll be able to send you over a purchase agreement. Um, and again, our purchase agreement is just one page. And then that's when I would just highlight all the benefits of it being a one page as opposed to a 10 page King James version of the of the contract. So um, 
that's big, man. Being able to position it like it's a benefit. That is the one because it really is. Because honestly, Byron's referring to we've had some people, and and that's that wasn't the first time, and it's been several times we had some people that's just like, man, it gotta be. We just absolutely need it to be the King James version. We just yeah. absolutely need it to be overcomplicated. And it's yeah. me, you might have sellers like that. And I have sellers just like, man, if you're going to send me one of them 10 pages, man, I, I don't really want to deal all of that. It don't got to be all of that. And I'd be like, well, that's why ours is just a one pager. So, yeah, no doubt, man. So, yeah, it's just one page, man. And if you're on IG, we live on YouTube, man. If you want to come check us out, we're going over this contract, how to get sellers on the contract. We're showing you the exact contract that you can use to get sellers on the contract, man. So, Join us live on YouTube. But um, but yeah, man, so this one page, very simple, very basic. Uh, a lot of times it, it's going to help you get people on the contract more than not. Um, like I say, every now and then you're going to run into people who want the King James Version, you know, with five pages, a whole bunch of terminology, a whole bunch of lawyer talk, you know. Um, but most of the time you're not, you know what I'm saying? So, um this is a contract that that you can use man i started out using this thing it's great it works great uh i never had an attorney say anything you know that would stop me from using this contract but we're just gonna go through here and kind of tell you how to fill this out also gonna put uh this contract in the description below um you know so here we go um I usually use Doc Hub to fill this out. So I think I got this on Doc Hub right now. So like, and I've already filled this out. So let's say if I wanted to go fill this out all over again, you know, we got a seller right now that we're gonna put on the contract. Let's say if we're gonna close the 21st, 21st day of, of September. We're going to close 21st day of September 2023. Um, let's say the seller is Cordero Martin. <laughs> so Cordero is selling his property to the buyer, which is buying Scott me. Cordero selling his property to me, right? I'm going to put Cordero address right here. I'm going to put the city, state, zip, and his county here. Um, you know, this is a, this is an important part of it right here, where it says, and buyer, Byron Scott, and or assigns, right? What does that mean, Cordero? <laughs> so, and or assigns means that Byron Scott, as the buyer, can assign this purchase agreement which basically means I can find another buyer who wants to step in at closing and take my place. That's essentially what an assignment is. And I think I need is the person that's taking your place. Exactly. I think we probably need to either do, you know, add it in here or do another video on how to the assignment contract um, as well. Cause I mean, that would be very helpful. Um, but I think to, to give a little bit more perspective on an assignment, there are other ways that you could essentially do a wholesale deal. And that's one, another way is to do the double close. And that's where essentially, you know, whether you do or don't have and or signs in the verbiage of the agreement, you can just close it. You can get transactional funding or some type or pass through funding or some type of funding that allows you to actually technically buy it and then go around, turn around and sell it again in that same day or within a short period of time. And what that is, if that's you bought it, that means Byron Scott bought it and then sold it to someone else, the new buyer. This one isn't, I bought it and sold it. This one is instead of me buying it, somebody is stepping in my place at the day of closing. That's what assignment means. And so that's why when you have the verbiage in here from the agreement, from the initial agreement that says, and or assigns, it allows you to do a straightforward assignment contract on the day of closing. Yeah, no doubt, because some sellers will tell you, like, straight up, like, hey, look, you know, uh, or they'll get somebody to look at it, and that person say, oh, this this contract is assignable. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Oh, I don't want to sign this. They told me it's assignable. You need to take that out. 
you know, and then you understand, that, oh, yeah, go ahead and take it out. What's your double close? <laughs> yeah. Like, that don't got to be too much. And that's one thing I think in the beginning, that's what people don't have clarity about is assigning the, the benefit of assigning versus doing something like a double close is when you double close, you do actually have to pay the closing costs on the first close and then the closing costs on the second one. And usually what happens is the buyer will pay their closing costs on the second one, but you have to pay the closing costs on the first one. And usually that means that they're going to take it out of your, your, your feet, your spread that you have. So if on this deal, we got, I got a 50 or let's say Byron, let's say Byron has a 15 K spread. Uh, and they're like, we don't want you to assign it. We don't want somebody else stepping in your place. We're doing business with just you. And we don't want to, we don't know that person. So they can't step in your place. He said, okay, I'll do a double close. Instead of walking away with a flush 15 K he might have to walk away with 13,725. Yeah. Something like that, you know, or, or whatever the closing call. It just entirely depends on, um, you, you know, that title company that you use and the closing costs that it costs or whatever. But when you do a straightforward assignment, usually the, the idea and what we think about when we're putting a deal together is like, if we can do a straightforward assignment, we get to keep the, the, the full spread. And usually, it, mean, it doesn't mean that we have to take any money out. But if you do a double close, it'll cost you a little bit more money. So it might be, you know, 1K, 2K less, but you get to close on the deal. And it's like if somebody does come and say, well, we take that assignment. My attorney said this is assignable. Take that out. We'd be like, OK, don't even give them no, don't even give them no fight because I'd rather have, you know, you know, 100 yeah. nothing is nothing. <laughs> so I'd rather have thirteen twenty-five than nothing. So yeah, exactly. yeah, no doubt, man. So yeah, that's that's kind of that part. Um, and you know, we kind of just skim over that part. If anybody like seller asks you that, you can know. I mean, you're being transparent. You just let them know, hey, this allows you know our investors to come in and you know uh, purchase the property or whatever. So. Bam, there you go. Um, uh, seller seller agrees to sell and buyer agrees to buy, man. So this real property and given that address, all that, all those details. Right here, I just put property sold as is. Um, the earnest money, a lot of times where people get hung up, say, oh, I ain't got enough earnest money, Mrs. Cordero. What do I do? I ain't got no earnest money. I could have put it on the contract, but I didn't have earnest money. You know, what, <laughs> what should I do in that case, Mr. Cordero, if I don't have the earnest money? You should just totally give up and go back and work your regular nine to five and never follow your dreams. That's what <laughs> you do. That sounds crazy, don't it? So <laughs> don't do that. I was just playing. Uh, but something to consider a couple of different factors. One, the earnest money could be a dollar. The earnest money could be $10. As you see, you put $100 in here. I think... Standard, I put 500. I think some people will say in, in more, of, uh, I guess, official circles like realtors, they'll say the earnest money is typically 1% of the purchase price, something to that uh, effect. But it can be $100 or $500 or whatever. But my biggest thing is when I get the, 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 the way we do it is we already have our buyers already. So when we go find these properties, by the time we about to get somebody under contract, we already know that we got some buyers at least interested in this price range that we can put the, a deal together. And so if, if I put if the seller comes and the seller has some sort of uh, predetermined notion about what they believe the earnest money needs to be like, I need 5K earnest money now or I need 20K. Then I'm going to go that I'm just going to go to the buyer and I'm saying, you like this property, you want this property, man. The seller needs 23K, you know what I mean? Or whatever it is, you know, I'm going to ask for a little bit more. Byron always says to double it, but, you know, if it, 2K, go to the buyer and say, hey, we need 4K. So that way, win, lose, or draw on this deal. If the buyer backs out, then you get to walk away with 2K on that deal. And so my point is, the, the earnest money. Uh, my bad, man. I had a couple of deals where it was like, uh, you know, the deal didn't go through. Buyer ended up backing out. Yeah. I made like 3K, like 3K, 3K. <laughs> I was making 3K of people not buying the property. You yeah. know what I'm saying? They're not winning the wholesale property. You know? 
And I, so, I ain't had that one happen yet. I ain't had yeah. that. Yep. So I wholesale the property and then I mean I'll uh collect that earnest money, then go wholesale the property. But the point yeah. is when you got the buyer already in line, the earnest let the buyer put up the earnest money. That's basically what I'm getting at, the simple of it. But when you really look at it in perspective, ask the buyer for a little bit more because the only way that the, the earnest money should re be released is if the buyer defaults or if the buyer backs out. And in this case, the buyer isn't you. The buyer is going to be whoever you're assigning it to. And if they back out, it's going to say in their contract that they owe you. And then their whatever money they owe you, that'll go their portion will go to the seller and the remaining will go to you. But yeah. fundamentally, though, what that looks like on a fundamental level, like how does that work out? Again, once, once you see and we'll do another video or show you how to do the assignment contract. But in the yeah. assignment contract, it'll be written out real similar, but it'll say the buyer is to pay a non-refundable earnest money deposit to the assigner, right? Which is Byron. Or are you the assignee? No, the assignee is the person who's taking your spot. Gotcha. The so assigner is the person who's doing the assignment. So in this case, it would be Byron. So it'll say the, the assignee owes a non-refundable uh, uh, deposit to the assigner. For 5k when you know the seller was just like i need 3k i need 3k for earnest money or else i don't trust you okay and then when you get that under contract with the seller and then you get that under contract with the buyer you send that into the title company the title company is going to be able to look at it which mine does most of them should be able to do this and say hey okay they're going to do the math and they're like well he gets 5k on here and i i'm gonna just be honest man you should put up the earnest money but i ain't put up no earnest money I ain't put up no earnest money like because I don't send the purchase agreement in without an assignment contract to go with it. I'm not even opening up escrow until I got the buyer locked up, which if yeah. you do it this way, should be like almost in the same day most of the times. Like really, really close to, to lose money. It's impossible to lose money that way. <laughs> Matter of fact, if it, even if the deal falls apart, to Byron's point, you still get money. You make yeah. your money, you win, lose a draw. Yeah, no doubt. So like yeah, if somebody asked me for you know two k earnest money, I'm going back asking the buyer for four k earnest money. You know what I'm saying? I'm going, I'm hitting the buyer up for more than what the seller hit me up for. You know what I'm saying? So that's a big key with earnest money. So you put the earnest money there, and then let's say if the person purchase price, let's say I want the Cordero want to sell this property for a hundred thousand dollars, right? So you got a hundred thousand dollars here for the purchase price. Minus the earnest money deposit, right? Um, that's that's going to leave us with ninety nine thousand nine hundred for what's owed at closing, right? Um, because it's hundred dollars, it's like a deposit. So you go ahead and send that in to the attorney's office, and they hold it until the day of closing. And then on the day of closing, they need to cur collect the rest of the funds from you, right? Or the buyer, whoever it is, you know what I'm saying? So that's why that number is that number, right? Um, and then I just put NA here, NA there, and then I put it right here, uh, the balance is due to the seller of this much at closing. It's gonna be paid in full. Um, and then down here, you just gonna put the closing date, right? Um, closing year, and then this right here is where the closing will be held at. And I always use Wiseman Law. Um, that's the closing attorneys you're gonna use. You can find closing attorneys on like Facebook groups. You know, hit Facebook groups, ask them in whatever area that is. Hey, what's a good wholesale friendly uh, closing attorney? Um, this number four is. Anytime that the seller asks, who pay closing costs? Who pay closing costs? Buyer will pay all closing costs, right? Minus any unpaid taxes, mortgages, or liens, right? You could always refer them to number four. The buyer pay. Buyer's going to be paying all the closing costs, right? Um, and then the only other thing that you're filling out is down here at the bottom, the due diligence period, right? Due diligence period on this contract, I always try to get 14 days. You know what I'm saying? Um, 14 days is plenty of time for due diligence for you to get your buyer in, 
him to figure out where his number is. If he back out, I can get somebody else to replace him. Uh, so 14 days is a real good time period uh, if you're going to do a due diligence, right? Um, if they want less, let's say if somebody want less, they want five days due diligence, right? If they go super aggressive, they want like one or two day due diligence, they probably not serious. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they probably just trying to get your money, you know, because if you let this contract go outside of this time period and you have not canceled it, but you know, let's say it goes outside of this time period and you don't close on this property, you're going to lose this hundred dollars right here, right? Because this right here says buyer will have 14 days inspect, uh, a day inspection period and has the right to counsel this agreement within, uh, with the written notice to the seller within the inspection period. The inspection period starts when the last party has signed this agreement. So when the last party signed that agreement, from that point, you got 14 days. After that 14 days, you have to close. And if you don't, you're going to give up that earnest money, whatever that is. It could be $10. It could be $100. It could be $5,000. You know what I'm saying? So just make sure you give them a written notice if you don't have a buyer locked in, right? That's why you got to get a buyer locked in because you're going to have some money on the line at the end of the 14 days, right? Yeah. I always, you know, and I always put a reminder, put a reminder in your cell phone, tell somebody to call you and say, hey, cancel that contract. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I had my VA, we just had one with a uh, due diligence period of 15 days. I told my VA, hey, look, Better tell me on this 15 day, on this day, I got a 15 days for it. Say, hey, look, on this day, you better tell me to terminate this contract. You know what I'm saying? No, I think it was like a day or two before the end of it, really. Yeah, dude, dude, no. Honestly, because it need to be like that. Because dude was like trying to drag his feet and like, oh, let me check, let me review this before I sign. Hey, we just sent you the written notice. Yeah, okay. that's all you got to do is send the written notice. They ain't got to sign. You just have to notify them. But again, fundamentally yeah. is what you want to look at this inspection period. Some, uh, you know, there are purchase agreements that don't have the inspection period, but go over to what is it? Nine to five wholesaler.com log into the, you know, sign up for the uh, monthly group in our discord. You'll be able to get access to that. But ultimately, if you do, then fundamentally what you need to be thinking in your head is not oh, at the end of 14 days, I'm going to owe earnest money if I don't do this. What you need to be thinking is I got 14 days to find a buyer. Yeah. That's to really get a buyer locked in. To get you a buyer. You already in. have buyers, but to get a buyer locked in, you to got get 14 them, days. To get them locked in and get their assignment contract and get that sent to the titles company to and make sure up. they do diligence. So you want that. Yeah. You want that buyer's due diligence to be over before before your due diligence is over. Yeah, and and if his, let's say if yours expire one day, and his expire the next day. <laughs> what if yours expire and now your hundred dollars on the line, and then he cancels right before his expire? You Which can happen. <laughs> can happen. And so Dude, when you, you think over an assignment contract, traditionally. You also send that buyer over a copy of this original purchase agreement because so they can see what they're being assigned. Because yeah. when they take over that assignment contract, that means that they are taking over your place for everything in this agreement. Now, what if I signed a contract with the seller that said, Oh, I'll pay you a hundred thousand uh, dollars uh, for the property, a hundred dollars earnest money, and I'm gonna sell my soul to you for this property. And then the buyer comes along and he assigned his name there. And then when he closed, he realized, dang, he does he didn't see this purchase agreement. He realized he got to pay a hundred thousand and his soul. You know what I mean? That would be wild. So he gets a copy of this to see what he's actually stepping in place of because everything that's in this agreement, he is signing on to. And so when he sees that, he should be able to see and, and don't leave it on him. It's not up to him. He should be able to see that there's a 14 day inspection the buyer and seller signed initially 10 days ago. So that means there's four days left. He should be able to see that. But then when you send it over to him, just let him know, hey, dog, as you can see, there's only four days left. So you're going to have to do your due diligence in the next three days and let me know before then. Because I got to cancel this 
contract or send them a written notice by the fourth day. So you can see it here. I'm not just telling you something. It's really written right there. You see it clear as day. Um, I got to You got to make your mind up in the next three days, dog. So that means you got to go out to the property, figure out a way to get the buyer in there. If the property's vacant, uh, get a lockbox, let them go over there, take a look at it or whatever. And at this point, you should have a decent. And this is another benefit of having a relationship with the buyers as opposed to just finding any Joe Schmo on Facebook is you can send them over to the property and interact. There's been times where I even gave the buyer the seller's phone number before the, because there was some stuff that they needed to work out with some tenants and all of that stuff. And I knew the buyer so well that I knew he wasn't going to cross me because I had brought him deals before and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? So it's just, I knew he, like he, I knew he wasn't going to cross me because, and so, because I, you go down. You've been feeding. You've been feeding. Yeah. You Man, feed me. Like the hand that feeds you. <laughs> or you will get cut off. Um, <laughs> you will get cut off. So that's something to consider. That's a big, again, that's probably one of the biggest fundamental tips about any contract that you got with a due diligence. That means you need to find a buyer and get them actually locked up under contract as well before the end of that due diligence period. And if your buyer requests a due diligence period, which is only right, make sure it's under the time and it does not fall outside of the time frame of this due diligence period. Because all that stuff we just talked about, earnest money and the buyer paying your earnest money, all that goes out the window when you're outside of the due diligence period without a buyer. You know what I mean? Mm, Lord. That statement right there, outside of due diligence period without a buyer, man, that's a lonely that's place. That's like a scary movie title. <laughs> that's a lonely place. <laughs> that's a scary movie title. That sounds like they got a part two and three outside oh, of the due diligence oh, period without a buyer whole, part four. Man, that's a whole scale of scary, scary movie right there. That's a whole scale of scary movie yeah. outside of your due diligence period without a buyer. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> one time. That hurt me, man. I think it happened to buy room one time, but that's all it takes is one time. One but you know, the, the best lessons learn from our mistakes. Don't go out there and make that same mistake. Just listen to what we're saying and make sure that you're paying close attention to this due diligence period. And when you get a buyer, that their due diligence period still falls well within. Give yourself that extra day. You don't want stuff coming down to the wire, too. So if this is 14 days, tell your buyers 13 days. And wherever, you know, say wherever it's been. So that way they know, listen, dog, if you can't make up your mind by then. Yeah, you can't get no buyer no long due diligence either. If you got 14, I mean, I don't know, man. I ain't giving no buyer more than like five days, period. It's like, yeah, they you know, it don't got a reason that we can't get into the property. You know what I'm saying? It's like after they see it, they should be able to make a decision like, boom. You know what I'm saying? It shouldn't take them a long time to make no decisions about the property. Not, not a real cash buyer. Not a not real cash. If they're doing all that, then they might be doing something else. They might be trying to find a buyer, too. They're trying to figure out if they can wholesale it or something. If they're like, man, I need 14 days for what? None of that. Like, you know, I got buyers that he'd be like, I'd be like, man, you can you drive by this property and go take a look at it real quick just to see if you be, just to see if you'd be interested. And he got an inspector he called on hand. He called him the when he go look at it, he get it inspected. So whether he gonna get the property, he gonna buy the property or not, he just gets an inspection that quick because yeah. he seriously he's a serious buyer. Not all buyers are gonna do that, but my point is, he if he, he know if he gonna buy a property when he when he go to it that one time, yeah. that's all he needs, right? And I want to take a step back though, back to the closing attorney, the title company uh, part of it. Um, one thing I want to say is really you want to make sure you already got a closing attorney um, and already vetted them out and make sure that they work with wholesalers uh, and stuff like that, that they're cool with doing assignments, that they're cool with doing a double close or pass through funding if need be, stuff like that. But again, like we always say, if you in that place where you like, man, I can't get I can't master it. I can't have it all figured out before I go. But I got a deal. And I got somebody I think want to buy it. So I think I need to go in and go. Um, you can go ahead. What did you have in there? It was like TBD, to be determined or something yeah. like that. TBD. You can put in TBD inside there. And that means to be, or especially if you're going to wholesale in a new market or something like that. You ain't yeah. figured that out yet. You like, man, we can get this under contract 
and I got the buyer already too. I got a guy who's interested at least. I'm going to get this seller on the contract and then I'm going to get the buyer on the contract. And then we can figure out a title company from there. And this is for those people who are just like, man, I'm, I'm leaning forward. I'm going forward into this so I can figure out the next step as I go. I didn't have that part figured out. And so just so you know, if you're ever in that situation, which again, I would advise you to have a title company and know who you're going to work with before, but you can. And then the best way to do it, you can do a Google search, but I personally think the best way is to go on Facebook and say, hey, in, in that local uh, wholesaling group, hey, what title company does wholesaling? Because those people are going to recommend not just title companies. They're going to recommend title companies that will do wholesale deals. That's not going to trip. Well, you can't do assignments and you can't do that and that and that. It's like you can't do it, but it can be done. Yeah, and everybody want to bring their type of company more business. You know what I'm saying? Everybody, you know, Cordero want to bring his type of company more business. You know, he wants somebody to roll up in there and say, yeah, Cordero sent me. And then, you know, the title company said, hey, Cordero, so he said, came in and closed the deal with us. You know, he want to be the guy who sent the title company more business. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Everybody. I I'll say this. My title company told me this was a couple years ago. They was just like, man, we really don't like working with wholesalers. We, we're not going to work with wholesalers anymore, but we're going to work with you still and a couple other people because we know you've been doing business. And so they told me, they was like, man, don't recommend me no new amateur people. But when I said I recommended Byron, it was like, thank you. It was like, they just like Byron, the big dog. They could tell because Byron rolled in there. He got his transactional coordinator and all of this. But there are like, but for the most part, to Byron's point is like, yeah, people want to because that's just going to make me look good. And especially if I recommend somebody like a Byron, somebody who's really performing, who provides a lot of value, because you got to understand bringing multiple deals. You got to think bringing, if I close, if I'm closing three, four deals a month with a title company, you know what I'm saying? That, that's the that's money. You know what I'm saying? It was like, dude, it was one point I was closing like 10 deals a month. You might be keeping any lights on. Exactly, dude. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm telling you, man. If you do that, and if I brought them, I'm just speaking hypothetically, if I brought them two, three, four more Byrons, if I introduced Byron and Keithon and some other heavy hitters and said, come over here, I'm putting an extra t- anywhere from an extra 10 to 20 deals a month in my title company's pocket, they're going to be like, thank Ooh. you, sir. That's like if you introduce me to a, a, a buyer who's buying that many properties. Like, yeah, dude. It's crazy. Yeah, 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 man. For sure. I mean, as a local person, shoot, yeah, they're going to be some mad respect. For sure. Yeah, um, man. But um, Rolex coming through, man. Rolex said, my God, happy wholesaler, man. Happy, happy wholesaler. Happy wholesaler. So, Rolex, uh, you can also reach out to realtors in the area as well who works with title companies in that area. Yeah, no doubt, man. You can't. Real you know, realtors are cool with wholesaling, though. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can reach out to some realtors, right? You, the, to be, to find realtors that's really cool with wholesaling, you know, they ain't the easiest thing, but you can reach out to some realtors. Some real estate agents are cool, you know what I'm saying? But it's a lot mm-hmm. of them that ain't you know, and the main ones who don't be cool with wholesalers, they be the main ones trying to wholesale. You know what I'm saying? Real talk, but I'm gonna say the main ones that don't be cool with wholesalers and this, they be the main ones that's lazy, that don't really want to do no work. They be the main ones that's just like they don't want to do no more than three or four deals a year, and they be intimidated by other people who's trying to do more than that. And they're just like, Man, you're doing too much. That's why they talk about what can't be done more often than getting the job done and they just not real hustlers and go-getters because if you work with a realtor just the same thing we said about the title company byron if you find a realtor who has buyers how many deals are you bringing that realtor a month Mm -hmm. or at any given time how many deals were you bringing that realtor it's just like you putting more business in their pocket so why why as a real estate agent and we have this conversation all the time but why as a real estate agent would i not want to work with somebody who wants to bring me business you know what I mean? That's crazy to me. And so it's just like, that's realtors. You can definitely, but I think maybe Rolex was just referring to realtors. Like, cause you know, we all got realtors. You got to figure out the realtors that's on your team. that like to, you know, that's the go-getters, that's the hustlers that work with investors, the ones that want the double listing, the ones that want to get money. 
work with them. And then you ask them what title company, they're going to have your back. They just they're going to be a good resource in general for anything or a good title company, maybe even a good contractor or something like that. Realtors can be a gift and a curse. <laughs> I mean, real talk. If you find the right realtor, you can that person could be the key to the city. That could be the player in that city that you needed to find that could get you access to everybody. If you find the right realtor that's well-known, established, and likes to work with investors and wholesalers. But if you yeah. find a traditional realtor who probably just got their license or they so um, focused on getting pimped out by their brokerage and stuff like that, like my brokerage said, I can't do this and can't do that and can't do this. Then that person going to act like you a problem just for getting people's problems solved. Meanwhile, we wholesaling deals where if that person try to list a property on the market, they get laughed at by the realtors or the realtor wouldn't do a good enough job. The realtor wouldn't show up to the showings. The realtor wouldn't do nothing to get their property fixed up. But we getting them a solid cash offer with no fees and they mad at us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, man. No doubt. So, yeah, I think. You know, real estate is definitely is a gift and a curse. I mean, you just gotta weed through there and find the good ones. But I think wholesale is the same way, man. You know what I'm saying? Like Very on true. my first deal, I had a 30k deal. Guy was trying to give me JV with him um, to sell to somebody who was offering less. You know what I'm saying? It's like he, he sent me over a JV agreement. You know, I could have messed around, signed that thing, and been stuck. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, sometimes, man, wholesalers be thirsty. Be star starving wholesaler, you know what I'm saying? Be trying to trying to cut in on your deal, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, you be careful with just people in general, you know. You got to be careful when you sign and stuff, you know what I'm saying? You should sign the agreement with the seller, and then you should sign the agreement with the buyer or an assignment with the buyer. Be careful when you get into all these JV agreements, this and that, and the third. Be on a daisy chain like crazy. Um, you know, it can get crazy, man. So just be careful out there. And talk to a real estate uh, attorney about, you know, even this contract when you send it in to them, make sure you're good. Um, and about anything else you're about to sign because they'll talk to you about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I remember the first time I did this contract, I sent it in to the attorney. It's like, hey, look, can you review this and let me know if there's anything in there that, that's not right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> So that's what I did. I sent it in. They was like, oh, this is good. And I was able to move forward. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I would do. No, where, no matter where I am, I send this in and, you know, just see what they say. Yeah, man, definitely. And that's kind of using the resources that you have available to you. And I think it would be in that bet that attorney's best interest to kind of give you a second opinion on this because it's like the concept if they believe that you could provide them value and provide them deals it's like well let me help this guy know what he's doing because if he's going to be bringing deals then he's going to help me out and so it's about creating that relationship and i guess to sum all of that up because whether it's like Byron said, wholesalers is just as can be a gift and a curse too it's just people it's you got to find the right people with the right mindset and it's just trying to go in the right direction that you're going. And that's just providing value to people. Um, and when you find the right people uh, or the right who's, they'll provide a lot of value to you, whether they're realtors, whether they're wholesalers, whether they're attorneys. But you got to be providing some type of value to them as well and just be clear and transparent on your communication with them. Let them know where you at and let them know what you're trying to do. And you're a. Uh, ability your capacity to kind of like articulate your vision and what you're trying to do will help you out tremendously so it was like regardless and and when you get that help and when you know for certain that you're going in the right direction and you're working with the right people that's when you start to get the right momentum um to to start getting a lot more deals done but if you want if you're watching this one and you're trying to put this together i'm assuming you're trying to figure out your first deal so i can just say it's just like Make sure that this is something you feel confident in. You need to know this contract well enough. I never call it a contract. I don't even feel, I feel uncomfortable saying contract now. I call it a agreement. purchase agreement. Yeah, I call it an agreement. Never use, somebody said earlier, never use the word contract. I always use the word agreement. 
Yeah, and I, I've heard people go even more in depth. It seems like the more time goes on, the more there are terms that we need to like stay away from. Like, don't say contract, say agreement, and then don't say don't say home, uh, say property. What'd you say? Don't say home, say property. Say property, and for uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on the person. If they talking about it like home, then they probably don't really want to sell it because it's yeah, like yeah. home is like something you want to keep. Uh, but I heard some people that don't say, let me get your signature or sign, say, let me get your autograph. And then I even heard some people on the, uh, the uh, what, not All Money In or All In podcast, all in. They, said, they said they don't say agreement. They say something. I forgot what it was, but they don't say agreement anymore. They say like, uh, I forgot what it is, but it's pretty cool. And I heard Keith Everett say, all right, let me get your autograph right here. But just kind of euphemizing these terms as to not sound like you know like a cheesy car salesman or because when i worked at t-mobile they would say don't do that we can't say we do contracts because people had a, a negative connotation about the term contract so we just yeah. say you know you're in an agreement or something like that um yeah. but nonetheless i would say if you're trying to do this you try trying to do your first one and i'm just trying to see if there's anything else like i said you need to know this line by line so you can go over it with that person and just kind of uh, explain everything. But basically, one thing I learned about agreements or a contract is that technically, especially in the state, like I know for a fact in the state of Tennessee, a verbal agreement can constitute litigation. Meaning if we have a verbal agreement about a property, uh, we could take that to court. But it will come second place if there was also another uh, written agreement there as well. So that means if me and Byron is talking and I'm saying I'm going to sell my property to him, but we got to, I said, dog, you got me. I got you. I'm going to sell my property for hundred K. You got me. And then Byron's like, cool. And then I go behind his back and sign it with somebody else. Byron could take me to court, but I don't know how well it will hold up because it was just a verbal agreement. Right. Yeah. But a written agreement can be, Oh, we had a restaurant and we took a napkin and I, I said, I will sell my house to Byron for this amount with all of this and this. And then Byron signed and I signed. It can be written and held up in the court of law with just on a napkin. He signed, I signed. And so when people get to talking and acting like this one pager isn't solid, it isn't enough on there, that's not absolutely true. Um, this absolutely is definitely more than good enough. Um, and, you know, I personally have done, I don't know how many, how many deals I've done with the one pager, but I'll tell you what, people like the one pager a lot more then I run into objections about a longer agreement, just by the way. Um, and so you need to know it line by line so that way you can explain everything to the people. Um, and number 11 says uh, this contract constitutes the entire agreement between purchaser and, and seller regarding the property. It supersedes all prior discussion, negotiation, agreement, uh, whether oral or written. Man, uh, should have had that line to you, girl, Kelly. <laughs> she kept talking about that 15k up front. <laughs> no, yeah, she, you man. gave that 15k up front. <laughs> it was like, dude, look, man, this agreement supersedes all the stuff that you're talking about. <laughs> I was just, so, just never agreed to that 15k. Yeah, <laughs> thought, we should have just been like, no, no, we have a standard. That's why. And I think <clears throat> to Byron's point, he said this so many times. That's why you have a way you do things. We could say, well, ma'am, I know you just got here, but the way we do it is we don't give no more than a, a 1K for closing calls. And the way we do it, and we, you know, you learn as you go, but the way we do it is we actually find the moving company and we pay them and we'll pay them this much and or, or whatever. That's just how we do it. And from now on, the next seller that we come across, that's what they're going to get. Ain't no, yeah. I need this, I need that. It's just like, hey, no, 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 no. This is how we do it. This is how it's going to get done. Yeah, no doubt, man. But shoot, man, it's been good, man, going through the contract. Um, you know, you could use anything like Doc Hub, DocuSign to send these out to sellers. You just need the name and the uh, email address, and you can send it right over to them. Um, but yeah, man, that'll get you all straightened out. So if you find that property that sells interest in selling, you already got the buyer waiting in the wings, you know, come back to this video. You know, the contract is in the description. Fill it on out. Boom. Send it on out to the property owner. 
you know, check with the attorney's uh, office, make sure everything's on up and up, that, that it looks good, and then send it out and shoot, and you'll be ready to go, get it signed, and uh, we'll show you probably next Fundamental Friday how to sign this contract to a buyer. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah no doubt, man, no doubt. But shoot, man, it was good. Y'all got questions. Make sure you leave them below in the comments below, man. Let, let us know, you know, uh, what kind of questions you have, what y'all want to see when we come live. Um, but until next time, man, peace out. I'll let y'all.